welcome to the kickoff of season four of the BizHack Live digital marketing training series in partnership with the Strive 305 initiative at the Miami-Dade Mayor's office. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack and the host of today's series. And we are just thrilled uh, to uh, welcome our partner, uh, from the office of the Miami of May, uh, the office of the mayor of Miami Dade County, uh, Danilo Vargas, who's going to do a quick welcome and, and talk about the Strive 305 initiative and the mayor's uh, efforts around diversity and inclusion. Dan, uh, it is really a pleasure to be with you all today. This is something I've been looking forward to for many weeks. Uh, to be here with such a, an amazing professional, a branding genius, a gifted speaker, best-selling author. Um, I have this book. Right here is one of the most, um, one of the books we enjoyed the most at the CEO book club that we had at Accelerate South Day in Cutler Bay, Florida. And so uh, this is part of the Mayor's Strive 305 initiative because we wanna make sure that in this time of change and a lot of flux that our small business owners learn how to become better marketers so that they can attract customers and grow their subscriber base and really be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are coming our way in the post-pandemic economy. So we are thrilled to be able to offer this through our partner, uh, BizHack, Dan and Lydia, and now we're gonna, we're gonna be in for a treat. And uh, I really can't wait. I hope that everybody not only listens and takes very careful notes, but takes action on the great things you're gonna learn today because they really can help you level up your business. So with that, Dan, Thank you so much for making this happen. Absolutely. And thank you, Danilo. And thank you to the Office of the Mayor for all the support that you are doing for small businesses across the county and across South Florida. I did also want to acknowledge our media sponsor, South Florida PBS, uh, and their health channel, uh, as well as our promotional partners who have helped us uh, spread the word about this amazing offering and have helped us achieve one of our initial goals, which was we have now more than a thousand registrations that we've gotten in the 10 master classes that we've run. Um, and uh, we, I can see the participant number kind of in, uh, edging upwards as people are joining us. Um, we are so grateful to these partners, the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, uh, ICABA, the Miami Foundation, uh, the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College, Miami Bayside Foundation, South Florida Interactive Marketing Association, CIC, the South Florida AMA, the Key Biscayne Chamber of Commerce, Creation Station, Cutler Bay Business Association, the FSMSDC, the Community Fund of North Miami-Dade, Access Helps, Chamber of Commerce of Coconut Grove, Miami-Dade Beacon Council, Aventura Marketing Council, and the Coral Gables Chamber of Commerce. We are adding to this list of promotional partners every day. And if you are interested in potentially becoming a promotional partner, you can email us at info at bizhack.com and we can talk about whether you would be a good fit. Uh, but we are so grateful. We could not bring these crowds uh, and, 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 and attract new uh, business owners that we're not currently serving, if not for your help. This is, as I said, the kickoff of season four uh, of the BizHack Live Masterclass series. And um, it's, it's so joyful for me to be able to welcome a, a friend and mentor, uh, Bruce Turkel, uh, to kick off this season. Um, we have a little bit of a surprise announcement we're gonna share with you. We're, we're gonna have, uh, hopefully, a, a, we're gonna have a bonus session coming up. Uh, but in addition to that, we have Brand Seduction uh, with Daryl Weber. Uh, and Mindful Marketing with Suzanne Jewell. Um, the theme uh, of season four is thought leadership. And we're bringing the top thought leaders nationwide around issues of branding, neuroscience, and mindfulness in marketing uh, to you in this series. And uh, we couldn't be more proud. So today we're gonna be talking about all about them. How to build your business today with Bruce Terkel. Bruce has a book. Uh, by that same name. It's sitting on my shelf right now. He's the author uh, of a number of books, uh, and we're going to be um, uh, sharing a little bit more about his bio here in a sec. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. Um, today, uh, as part of the thank you for showing up, um, we're going to give you a handout with some key takeaways. We're gonna give you a link to our YouTube channel where you can find a recording of today's session. 
in case you want to share this with other people. A lot of you say, hey, uh, I'd like to watch it again, or I'd like to share it with a friend. These all within 24 hours are up on our YouTube channel, uh, free to the public and, and an opportunity for you to share that. Um, you are automatically registered for all of our season four and all of our upcoming master classes. Um, and uh, at the end of today uh, at 1.30 Eastern, uh, we're gonna actually have a brief info session uh, about the scholarship program that BizHack has specifically designed for uh, underserved businesses, women-owned, uh, BIPAC, BIPOC-owned, uh, who are interested in upgrading their marketing through our training program. So I'll share a little bit more with you about that uh, at the end of today's webinar. So without further ado, uh, I wanted to bring Bruce uh, to the stage. You know, you can see uh, a little bit in these bullet points about who Bruce is professionally, but I just wanted to tell you sentimentally who Bruce is um, because my personal journey, my life has been changed by Bruce Turkel. Uh, and he entered my life in two very critical moments. The first moment he entered my life was right after I lost my job as a journalist at WLRN um, and I needed to reinvent myself and I wanted to reinvent myself as a marketer. Um, and I remember, it's actually kind of funny, uh, it was Daniela Levine Cava, the now mayor uh, of the county, who referred me to Bruce. Um, at the time, Daniela was my wife's boss at Catalyst Miami, and I was talking about how I wanted to kind of get into the marketing field, and she says, I know exactly who you should talk to, Bruce Turkel. Well, Bruce, who was then running uh, Turkel Brands, an agency, invited me into his uh, you know, his office uh, introduced me to his staff, introduced me to his business partner, let me sit in on meetings and basically showed me what marketing was, especially uh, what a brand agency does. Um, well, that kind of was the beginning of a mentorship and friendship that has lasted many years. Bruce has been a participant in a couple of the programs that we've run. Uh, and I was a participant in a mastermind group that he ran. I hope he tells you a little bit about some of the uh, offerings he has, like, like the mastermind group, that was the second moment when Bruce changed my life. So uh, he kind of kicked me off on my marketing journey. And then in the middle of COVID, when I was honestly feeling just depleted and depressed, Bruce convened this extraordinary group uh, of professionals and he reinvigorated me. Uh, and he really is 100% uh, you know, the reason that I was able to find a new level of energy and motivation to keep going with the BizHack Live series, keep going with BizHack Academy, and just keep going uh, during that really rough patch that we all went through and are still going through. So with that, Bruce, um, I am so grateful to you. And it's so such an honor you know, to be able to acknowledge you publicly and to let people know how incredibly meaningful and important a human being you are for me. As a, as a person and as a founder and as a business owner, when we started the BizHack Live uh, initiative back at the beginning of COVID, it was uh, Lilia's idea and Bruce was, I think, our second or third speaker. Uh, we drew massive crowds. Uh, he came back again. So uh, without further ado, uh, welcoming back uh, one of our very favorite BizHack Live presenters, uh, Bruce Turkel. So Thank you, Dan. That, that was beautiful. When I speak on stages around the world, certainly before COVID, and now it's picking up again, after a particularly nice introduction, which happens sometimes, I always say, you know, I really appreciate that introduction. And every time I hear something like that, boy, do I wish my wife and my mother were here to hear it. And since you're going to be recording this, I will see if I can get them to, uh, to watch on YouTube. So thank you very much. I could spend just as much time talking to everybody about what, how you and Lilia have helped me with my online marketing. But I want to get into the meat of what we want to talk about, because there's a bunch of people here on this uh, webinar, and there's a lot to talk about. If you can't stay, if you have to go, if, you're, if your Wi-Fi shuts down, I want you to remember this. Don't focus on your business. Focus on your customer. I mentioned my wife a, a few minutes ago. Um, I was speaking at a conference out of town and it was at a very lovely location. So my wife came with me and the organizer of the event asked if the two of us would like to have dinner 
with she and her husband that evening. So I said, of course, we'd love to. We went to dinner with a couple we really did not know. Obviously, the woman was my client, but that was about all we knew about her. Um, and we're having, you know, the kind of conversations you have with people you don't know, getting to know one another. You know, where, where'd you grow up? What do you do? How many kids do you have? On and on and on. And at one point, the woman says to us, how long have you all been married? At the time, we had been married 25 years. And I started to say 25 when my wife says 23. So I kind of go like 20 out. And I take my drink and I cover my face and I don't answer. My wife says 23, at which point the woman that we were sitting with turns to her husband and in a stage whisper, meaning it's a whisper meant to be heard by people who are not on the stage. She says to her husband, you see, he doesn't know. Men never know. Women always know, but men never know. Truth of the matter was I was correct because I happen to know those things. And in our relationship, I do and my wife doesn't. It's just not really that important. But at which point my wife has now done the arithmetic in her head and says, I mean, 25 years. So if you think about it, that's kind of the end of the conversation, except I'm a marketing guy. I want to understand why people do what they do, why they say what they say, why they think what they think, and more importantly, why they buy what they buy. So I'm giving this a lot of thought. And it dawned on me that anytime you're asked that question, how long have y'all been married? Whether you know the number or not, there's only one correct answer. It's three words. How long have you been married? Not long enough. That's the answer I always give. Why? Well, first of all, you can never be wrong. Not long enough. There's no number there. You can't be wrong. But second of all, the point of knowing how long we've been married, the amount of years doesn't really matter. What matters is the life spent together, the commitment to one another, the families raised, the love that's been shared. Not long enough says that there's more of that to come, that it's been wonderful and it's only going to get better. Why? Because by saying not long enough, what am I doing? I'm making my wife feel good about herself. Sure, I'm making her feel good about me, but more importantly, I'm making my wife feel good about herself. Here's a takeaway. Great brands, good brands rather, good brands make people feel good, but great brands make people feel good about themselves. The key to building a successful brand and a successful business is to make your customers feel good about themselves because they do business with you. And so by saying not long enough, that's what I do, but it does something else. Because remember, the other part of business is not only to win, but we have to beat our competition. Every time I say not long enough, my wife smiles, which if you think about it is kind of funny because she knows I say this, she knows I say it on stage. I've said it a hundred times, but it doesn't matter. My customer, my wife feels good about herself, but the competition, what happens? The wife of the other couple turned to her husband and said, why don't you ever say that? Which means I won and he lost, which means I won twice, which as I see it is what's called a win-win situation. I win, the competition loses, and more importantly, I am now primed for more purchases, in this case, more years of marriage from my customer. Who doesn't want that? in the messaging strategy that they do. You win, your competition loses, and you prime yourself for more business. It's perfect, it's simple, and it's fun. Now, let's look at the alternative. Usually when you're at an event like that, when I go to a conference, when I speak at a convention, if I was with you all in person instead of on, on Zoom, we would meet ahead of time or we'd meet afterwards at a cocktail party. And we would, all be in where, we would all be wearing name tags that would say, hello, my name is, then you'd fill your name in, right? And probably your company. Think about that. Your name 
is your label. It's your brand name. And your company tends to have the words of what you do in the name. So basically, the way you present yourself is label and function. Here's my name. Here's what I do. Here's the name of our company. Here's what we do. Here's the name of my firm. Here's what we sell. Here's the name of my professional association. Here are the services we provide. We mostly market ourselves using those two things, label and function. What's bizarre is that we do this in 2021 because 2022 rather, because every bit of technology we use to run our businesses from internet to uh, blockchain, I saw in the chats, to NFTs, to all those things has changed in the last five, 10, 15 years. Yet that technology of label and function has not changed, not in 10 or 15 years, not in the new century, not in 50 years, not in 100 years, but maybe in 500 years. 500 years ago, if your last name was Baker, Pat Baker, Terry Baker, it's because what did you do for a living? You were a baker. If your name was Archer, it's because you were in the militia and you actually fired arrows. Or perhaps your name was Bowman. Or maybe your name was Carter. Maybe your name was um, Alex Carter. Why? Because you drove a cart. If your name was Goldsmith, it's because you made things out of gold. If you lived in Germany, your name would have been Goldstein. You made things out of gold, unless you made things out of copper, in which case your name was messenger, which means copper maker in German. We were named by our functions. Now, we don't do this anymore because, of course, you've never met someone who's named um, Michael Hedge Fund Manager or, oh, I don't know, um, Terry Neuros Neurosurgeon but we still use this same function. Hello, David, it's good to see you. Um, or good to not see you, but good to know you're here. We still use this same concept of label and function. What I'm asking you to do is turn the lens around. Stop talking about yourself. Stop talking about your business. Start talking about your customer. Your business marketing, your business branding should not be a bad blind date. And then I did this, and then I did that, and then I went to school here, and then I got this degree, and then I did this, that, and the other thing. Your business marketing should be about your customer, what you do for them, and more importantly, how they will feel better because they did business with you. Why? Because these days we each carry one of these little magical devices around made of silicon and glass that know everything. Siri, Alexa, Cortana, Google, they know everything. So the point is that your customers know everything they want to know about you or as little as they care to know about you before they ever do business with you. Used to be that you had to blow your horn to tell people how good you were because otherwise there's no other way they could find out. But today, today there's no need. Today you can cut right through that and go directly to your customer. But there's another reason. And that reason is that with all the things that are made today, for the most part, the manufacturer does not put the value in, the customers do. That's because Today, thanks to globalization, democratization of information, and computerization, you can buy anything, anywhere, anytime, any price. Used to be that you could only buy things that were near you. If you were a good dentist, you were pretty clear to have all the business within a small area that people could travel to you. But today, people can go online, they can do some digital uh, search, um, um, scanning of their mouths, and they can have Invisalign created and shipped to them. Today, we can buy anything online. We can buy anything, anywhere, anytime, any price. And so just being good at what you do, just adding value to your products is no longer a productive business strategy. And I see that Dana's leaving, Diana rather, and that's too bad because I was just going to talk about jewelry. If you look at this little ring here, this is a wedding ring. 
Just took it off my finger, I promise. This wedding ring is only worth, as a product, as a widget, as a production item, it's only worth the weight times the price of gold. That's it. There's no value in this for manufacturing, for production, for design, for distribution, for logistics. It's worth the weight times the price of gold. And we know that the price of gold goes up and down. I don't happen to know what it is today. I also don't know how much my ring weighs, but that the, the weight doesn't change, but the price goes up and down. So it's worth different amounts of money at different times. What's more, it's worth different amounts of money based on when you buy it and if, in fact, you sell it. Because think about the two scenarios. When you buy this ring, you and your beloved, you and your fiance, the person you're going to spend the rest of your life with, theoretically, the two of you walk into the fancy jewelry store in the mall, or you walk into Diamonds on the Key to meet with Diana. And what happens? You look at the mall, and then one of you goes, oh, my God, I want that one. And that one is worth a whole lot more money when you pay for it than when you leave the court, the bar, and you walk into the pawn shop and you throw the ring down on the table because now you're divorced. And of course, the guy with the gun on his hip does not give you the same amount of money that you paid for the ring way back when in the fancy jewelry store. So the value goes up and down, not only based on the price of gold, but also based on when you buy and when you sell. What's more, we don't, in fact, get any value out of this thing. It's simply an icon, a symbol. Everything it stands for, love, commitment, fidelity, promises, all those things the consumer puts into the product. The product has no additional value. You hear about people who get robbed and they lose their jewelry. And what do they say? I don't care about what it was worth. It was the sentimental value, right? The sentimental value because it was my grandmother's brooch, because it was my grandfather's high school ring, because it's the pin I was given at my bar mitzvah, or it was the, uh, the bracelet I was given at my kinse. It's sentimental value. The manufacturer had nothing to do with sentimental value. And yet, these products are worth more or less based on what we put into them. But there's one company that has figured out how to make these products worth more money every time they sell them. And I'll tell you another quick story. Um, I was out of town on one of our anniversaries. Now I know, I've now been married 36 years, I know having been married that long, that being out of town on an anniversary is not the greatest idea. But remember, I told you, you can buy anything, anywhere, anytime, any price. And so I was able to pick out the perfect gift for my wife, order it, and make sure it was delivered on time. Why? Because we all carry these magical devices. I was not only able to find it, order it, pay for it, I could also track the shipping. So I knew when it was being delivered. I knew when it left New York, when it got to the distribution center in Tulsa, when it got to Tupelo, when it got to Homestead, when it got to Hialeah, and then when it was delivered to her office in Carl Gables. And notice, I sent it to her office, not our house. Why? Well, first of all, because I knew my wife would be there, not at home. But second of all, because I'm a marketing guy and I thought about this. What happens? The UPS truck pulls up at my wife's office. Uh, Erman, the UPS guy, gets out and goes inside. Now, I already know that Miriam, the receptionist, loves the UPS guy, Edmon. He always flirts with her. He wears the little shorts. You know the whole routine. So she's very happy when she sees him. Hola, Erman. And she puts the box, takes the box, and then she looks at the name on the, on the label. So she gets on the loudspeaker and she says, Gloria Torquel, please come to the front desk. There's a package for you, Gloria Torquel. Well, I also know that my wife is seeing patients and she is not rushing out to the front desk. But who is? Everybody else in the office who's not busy at that moment is coming out because they know it's our anniversary and they wanna see what it is. So there's this, this corrugated box. It's got a label, it's got an address. There's no company return name on it. And they're all looking at it. And what are they saying? Oh my God, I wonder what's in there. Oh, Bruce must've sent this. I wonder what it is. So by the time my wife gets there, What's happening? 
They're all telling her how wonderful I am. By the way, that's called word of mouth advertising, right? She might be annoyed at me because I'm out of town, but all the people she works with are telling her how awesome I am. Oh, my husband never does that. Oh, he would never remember, blah, blah, blah. She then takes the, uh, the letter opener. She slits open the, the corrugated box. She opens the flaps. She reaches in and she pulls out what? A blue box with a white label. You all know that, what that means, right? Blue box with white label, something from Tiffany's. At which point, everybody in the room goes, ah, oh, they don't know what's in the box. It doesn't matter. The point of it is that we've been married 36 years. What am I gonna come up with that she wants that she doesn't already have anyways? But it's irrelevant because the Tiffany's box, the blue box with the white label sends a message. Now, here's a fascinating thing. You can walk into a Tiffany store and it's full of all kinds of incredibly beautiful and expensive items, right? You can buy watches and you can buy rings and you can buy necklaces and you can buy bracelets and you can buy cut glass crystal and you can buy pens. You know what you can't buy? You can't buy the blue box with the white ribbon. You can't say to the salesperson, yeah, yeah, I don't want any of that stuff. I just need a box about yay big and the white ribbon, please. They won't sell it to you. They don't charge you extra for it, but they won't sell it to you because the blue box with the white ribbon is how the product makes the customer feel good about themselves. Now, since we're all in this together and my job here is to give you ideas to improve your business and your life, here's a little tip. You can't buy the blue box and the white ribbon at Tiffany's, but you can buy them on eBay. I'm not saying I have, I'm saying you can. Tiffany understands that this product is this product no matter where you buy it, but you put it in a blue box and you tie on a white ribbon and it's worth up to 80% more. Price of gold didn't go up 80%. There's no more design, logistics, or anything else in it. It's simply what it brings to the table. Here's a very, very simple algorithm I would like you all to write down. Pen and paper, write it on your phone, write it on your laptop, whatever. It's just four characters. Plus sign, plus F, minus F, plus F, minus F. This is going to be one of the secrets you're going to use moving forward to improve your brand value and increase your profits. Plus F, minus F. And quite simply, what it stands for is plus F, more feelings, plus feelings, plus F, more feelings, minus F, less facts more feelings, less facts. What was in the box was irrelevant. It doesn't matter how much it weighed, what it cost, how long it would last. The feelings were what mattered. This happened this morning. I can't see all of you guys on this little chart here, so I don't know how many hands are gonna go up, but I assume that a number of you watched Vladimir um, Zelensky in his speech this morning to the US government, to the Congress, the Senate, the president, and of course, to all of us. And he is a master of more feelings, less facts. What did he talk about? He specifically talked about emotional responses to the Russian incursion. Whenever he used numbers, the size of the invading army, or the smaller size of the defending army, the size of the landmass, the amount of time, those are facts, but they were all used to build an emotional response. More importantly, what did he use as examples? He used two examples that we all hold, I have to stand up a little bit, right here. He talked about Pearl Harbor and he talked about 9-11, why? because Pearl Harbor is an iconic, iconic indication of when we as Americans were attacked. There is nobody on this call who knows someone personally who died at Pearl Harbor because none of us are old enough 
Maybe a few people were even barely alive when Pearl Harbor happened, 1941. Yet it has an emotional memory that we all respond to. And then he talked about 9-11. Why? Because everybody in the room that he was addressing lived through 9-11. And they all had emotional responses. And Dean says the video was effective. The video was incredibly effective because we were able to put ourselves in the situation that he showed. It's critical to understand that when you're building a business, building messaging, or building a political um, movement, the facts are different, but the truths are universal. So the fact that this was a war that Russia is imposing upon its neighbor is very different than either 9-11, which was not our neighbors, or Pearl Harbor, which was not our neighbors. But the universal truths, surprise attack, the awful loss of life, and then our response to it, the universal, the truths rather, are universal. And it's the same with your business. What you sell, what you do, what you produce, those are the facts. Those are critical to get right. I'm not suggesting you don't have to be good at what you do, but messaging it is all about your ability to get an emotional response from your customers. And more importantly, and Zelensky proved it, from your potential customers. Because the people he was presenting to, there were customers there, right? There were plenty of people who have okayed money to be given, who have okayed support. The Biden administration has done an amazing job of bringing together NATO and having a multilateral response. But there's also a number of people in our country who've been pushing back, who have been supporting Putin, who have been saying that Zelensky, in fact, uh, one of the congressmen said that Zelensky was a thug, believe it or not. So they are potential customers. And Zelensky understood that if he just talked about facts, if he just talked about figures, you can always argue that. But when he pulled our emotional heartstrings, everything changes. And this is something you can do in your business. If you'll bear with me while I share my screen, I want to show you the tool you can use this afternoon when you go back to work to make your business better. Now, as a completely cheap plug, my last book, All About Them, this chart that I'm gonna show you is in the book and ins instructions on how to do it are in the book. I'd love for you to buy it, I'd love for you to read it, but if you pay attention, you'll pretty much get what you need. So I'm gonna share my screen. Um, where is it, there we go. And participants can now see my application. Great. So you see, and somebody please nod yes. You see where it says uh, classic brand pyramid? Okay. So this is what we are going to do. This is what we are going to build. This is how you're going to run your business. Now, I'm going to give you a little map. This you can draw yourselves, or again, you can buy my book and it's in the book, but you're going to do the work on your laptop or on your computer or on a, a sheet of legal paper. It doesn't much matter. I'm simply giving you the roadmap to build your messaging strategy. So the first thing I want you to do is quite simply draw a pyramid. A pyramid is a triangle. I don't care if it's obtuse or acute or isosceles, it's irrelevant. Just draw a, a triangle. If you have a, a plastic triangle like this, you can use that. Does not matter. And then I want you to um, divide your pyramid. Oops, wrong way. I want you to divide your pyramid into five sections. Easy to do. Now here comes the work. By the way, all of this is easy to do. It just takes effort and it takes thought. The first thing I want you to do is write down all the reasons to believe. Why is your company, your firm, your business, your partnership, your LLC, whatever, why should your customers and potential customers, clients and potential clients, consumers and potential consumers, why should they believe that you are the people to do business with? So this is where you're going to put your locations, the partners you have, the products you offer, the certificates, the education. This is essentially 
your bio, your business inventory, your asset list, all of those things. As I said, you're not going to do it on this roadmap. You're going to actually do it in your laptop. You can have your accountant. You can have your operations manager. You can have your inventory manager, depending on the size of your business. You can have all of your uh, employees fill this out. What do we offer? What do we have? What are our products? What are our reasons for being in business? By the way, you can abbreviate because our, uh, reasons to believe is abbreviated as RTBs. This should take you a long time. There should be a lot of reasons why people should do business with you. Not the most important, not the most prevalent, all of them. This is your inventory. This is your foundation. And then you're going to ladder up. So reasons to believe are RTBs. You're going to ladder up to what are called PODs. Now, PODs, it's plural because there's two of them, stands for points of difference and points of distinction. What is different about your business and what is distinct about your business? Different. What makes you different than the competition? What makes you different from the other choices that your customers have when they go to purchase your goods or your services elsewhere? Notice differences. I didn't say uniquenesses. A lot of agencies talk about USP, unique selling proposition, or they'll talk about the X factor or the black box. They're looking for uniqueness. But the truth of the matter is, first of all, there aren't that many things that are unique because the definition of the word unique means unlike any other. And I dare say there's nothing in your business that is absolutely unlike any other. Why? First of all, that's very hard to accomplish. And second of all, nobody's looking for something if they don't know what it is, right? You're answering the question that hasn't been asked. Selling a product that no one's ever heard of, no one knows what it is, and no one knows why they need it or want it is not a very good way to build a business. You were told, by the way, that you need a USP by people who create USPs, by people who do what I used to do, own agencies, own creative firms, and come tell you they're going to figure out what your unique selling proposition is. But unique is a perfect word. It means unlike any other. You can't be a little unique, sort of unique, kind of unique, very unique. You're either unique or you're not. No different than being a little excellent, a little perfect, or a little pregnant. You're pregnant or you're not. You might be a month pregnant or nine months pregnant. You could be more or less pregnant, but you are or you're not pregnant. You are or you're not unique. So don't worry about uniqueness. I spent a lot of time on this because people suffer so painfully and then realize that being unique is not an attribute when you run your business. So POD stands for point of difference. What's different about you? And points of distinction. What are you really good at? What do you, where do you really stand out? Remember, we're not talking about perfect or excellent. Those words have no place in marketing. We're talking about what you're good at. PODs, points of difference, points of distinction. We then ladder up one step and we get to rational benefits. What are the rational benefits that your clients and potential clients have from doing business with you? Why do they come to you? By the way, most marketers who even think about marketing this is all they ever do. RTBs, what do we got? Reasons to believe, what do we got? PODs, points of difference, points of distinction, where are we better? Where are we special? And then rational benefits. What are the rational benefits that our customers have? So you, you, you lay out your services, right? We have 18 offices, we have 42 trucks, say habla espanol, we've been in business for 300 years. Those are RTBs. Points of difference, we are Miami's oldest uh, financial institution, or we are Miami's newest hotel, right? Those are points of difference, points of distinction. And then what are the rational benefits? Oh, you can stay with us in our hotel tonight for $2.99, or we have a BOGO, buy one, get one free. Anytime you see promotions, price off, special deals, those tend to talk to rational benefits. And as I said, most companies that even market themselves at all, 
even think about this stuff, that's where they stop. Hence the red line at rational. But you can see there's two steps above this on our pyramid. And so we're going to talk about how you get there. But you all run small businesses, so let me give you an example, an example you can use to create what you're going to do. Let's say you owned a coffee shop in an industrial park west of the airport, somewhere in Doral, off of 25th Street, west of the Palmetto, one of those walled or fenced in areas with the, you know, the, the warehouses and the trucks come in and the trucks go out all day long. And you owned... Um, Let's come up with a name for it. You owned uh, La Esquina de Doral, right? You had the little coffee shop, La Esquina. And that's your business. So now you're looking at this chart. Well, what are your reasons to believe? What are your RTBs? What are your business assets? Well, we have tables and chairs and air conditioning and a coffee maker and we have an oven and a microwave and televisions, right? You list everything you got. And then what are your points of distinction? Hmm, that's kind of tough. Uh, our food's good. Prices are fair. What are your points of difference? Uh, it's also tough because we sell, you know, Cuban sandwiches and deli sandwiches and salad. Oh, our point of difference. We are the only restaurant within the industrial park. Okay, that's a point of difference, right? Great. What are the rational benefits of people doing business with you? Hmm, well, let me think. Oh, well, obviously, if they're hungry, we feed them. That's the obvious reason. Um, your employees can go to lunch and they don't have to go for very long. You don't have to, they don't have to drive out of the industrial park and then cross 36th Street to where, across the Palmetto to where all those restaurants are in the mall, but it's very crowded and it takes too long, right? So, okay, that's a rational benefit. It's good for your business. What else? Well, um, oh, if your biggest customer is coming to, to tour your location, we can bring donuts or bagels or coffee or sandwiches. If you're having a party, we, right? Now, think about the advertising, the marketing, the branding, the messaging that you've seen for a company like this. It's got the name across the top, La Esquina, right? And then it lists the RTBs. It talks about what they have, right? We have five tables and chairs, ice cold air conditioning, uh, plenty of parking. Those are all RTBs. Then it talks about the differences and the distinctions, right? Which is the only restaurant in the Doral Industrial Park. Um, and then they move up to the rational benefits, right? Because there's a menu, rational benefits. Come here and have a great meal and save some money. So they have, you know, Magnificent Monday and Taco Tuesday and woo, Wednesday. And uh, I don't know, they have something else for Thursday and then they have, thank God it's Friday because we also have beer. So that's what they do. And that's where they stop. And Danilo and, uh, and the BizHack folks gave me a list of some of the people who were coming. So I went and looked at a number of your websites. I don't want to pick on anybody here. I'm not going to. But that's what your websites do. They tell me what you have, who your partners are, what your mission statement is. They tell me what makes you great. And it's all superlatives, the highest level of service, committed to the finest. And then you tell me what you got. Boom, boom, boom. Exactly the same way that the folks at La Esquina sell their restaurant. But what happens if you decided to think bigger? What happens if you stepped up a notch? What happens if you looked at what Tiffany's does, the blue box and the white ribbon, or what Nike does, or what Porsche does? or what Tesla does. Certainly we buy products from them, that's how we give them money, but we buy much more than that, don't we? We buy brand value. How do we move this restaurant, a restaurant that sells Cuban sandwiches and fried chicken and croquetas and Cuban coffee, how do we take this little restaurant and move it up? Because if they can do it, I dare say you can do it. So let's look at that, shall we? The next step on our triangle, oops, I went the wrong way again. The next step are emotional benefits. What are the emotional benefits of your customer doing business with you? Well, in the case of 
uh, La Esquina, if we go back to the book all about them, we talk to our customers. We find out who they are. We find out what they care about. And what do they tell us? You know, I really like working here. I have a great job. But man, it sucks to get here in the morning because I come from Palmetto Bay or I come from Miami Springs, or I come from Miami Shores, and I have to come out on the Palmetto, and I have to come out on 836, and I have to come out on the Gratney, and oh my God, the traffic is awful. Well, if I own La Esquina, and I already have coffee machines, and I already have tables and chairs, and I have Wi-Fi, and I have air conditioning, I say, you know what? Instead of leaving your office, your home rather, at a quarter to eight, to get here by nine, to get to work, and to be all pissed off and sweaty and annoyed, why don't you leave your home at seven when there's very little traffic and come here? We have free coffee in the morning. We have the news shows. We have all three channels. We have MSNBC. We have CNN. We got Fox. It's all on. We have Wi-Fi. Why don't you come here? Get here an hour early. No traffic. Get your work done. Do your email. Read the newspaper. Have a cup of coffee. Have a nutritious breakfast and feel good about going to work so you are a better employee and your life is better. Hmm. Never thought about that. Never dawned on me that a little coffee shop could make me feel better about myself. Or how about this? All about them. We talk to our customers and what do we find out? Our customers tend to be young, married with small children. The husband works in the uh, industrial park, the wife works in the industrial park, and the husband works somewhere else. They both work in the industrial park, whatever. And so we talk to them about what it's like. And they say, well, you know, by the time I get home, I mean, I work till five theoretically, but I usually I'm here till six and then I have traffic all the way home. And then I get home at seven, the babysitter's just leaving. I haven't had time to cook any dinner. My wife hasn't had time to cook dinner because she just got home from her job at the hospital. The kids are starving. So what do we do? Well, we make him a frozen pizza or we'll call Uber Eats or my husband will run to, uh, to McDonald's and, and get something. We feel guilty. We're not giving our kids a good, wholesome, nutritious meal. So what if we said at La Esquina, you know what? Come in on Monday and we will give you a menu for the week and you pick all the meals you want. And when you're ready to leave work, just text us and we'll meet you out front. You don't even have to get out of your car and we will give you a packaged meal. And you say your son is, um, is, is uh, gluten, gluten resistant. Okay, we won't have gluten in, in his thing. Or your daughter is paleo, your husband is paleo or whatever, or kosher or halal or low fat, whatever. We will create that and you will have a home cooked, packaged, healthy dinner for your children. By the way, it doesn't cost any more than going to Pizza Hut. It doesn't cost any more than going to, uh, to making some frozen food. It's like a cantina, except it's here. You can watch us make it. You know where we are. You've been here every day. But the most important part is you're a better parent because you do business with us. Not we have better food, but you're a better parent because you do business with us. So if we go back to our chart, what lives at the top is brand value. And brand value is what makes your business more profitable, what makes your business more attractive to your customers and your potential customers at very little cost. In the case of La Esquina, they actually make money from building their brand value. And you can do the same thing. If you focus relentlessly, not on your business, but on your customers. If you understand who your customers are and why they matter. And more importantly, why they are better at who they are because of who you are. Now, if we were in a big room instead of on this, um, on this chat where everybody is in these little grids, what we would do is look around and look at all the businesses around us. And what we would realize 
is that all of us do the same thing. Yeah, we sell different products, we sell different services, but we all do the same thing. We all use our education, our skills, our superpowers, our business assets to make our customers' lives better. If we didn't, they wouldn't buy from us. Sure, what we might sell if we're an accounting firm or we're a law firm, we might sell compulsory services, but they don't have to buy them from you. They can buy them from anyone. We all do exactly the same thing. We all use exactly the same tools. We all build the pyramid the same way. Uh, the book I wrote before all about them was called Building Brand Value, and it was the seven steps that each one of us uses, every company uses to build a brand, and they're all the same. So the question then becomes, what is the takeaway that you can use to take the same tools, the same business uh, um, formulas, the same tools, tips, and techniques to make your business stand out? to make your business special, to make your business successful. And that's the last thing I'm going to talk about. But before I do, just a little bit of housekeeping, if you don't mind. First of all, I want to thank um, the county, Danilo, the mayor, everyone who invited me to be here. Lilia and Dan, thank you so much for setting this up. I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to tell you that I am very easy to get in touch with. My website is my name. It's bruceturkel.com. My email address is my name. It's bruce at brucetorkel.com. My phone number is on my website. Very easy to get in touch with. Also, I, um, I write a blog post about these things every single week, looking at what's going on and how you can use what's happening in the world to make your business better. If you're interested in receiving it, there's no charge. I don't sell anything. If you're interested in receiving it, then all you need to do is go on my website and a little box will pop up and you can register. If you don't wanna do that, you can send me an email and I will register you. But I, I'm giving you this information week after week after week to show you how to put these tools to work for you. We have uh, 10 minutes left. I have five minutes to conclude, but before I do, I wanna take a few questions. So uh, Dan, would you run a Q&A for a few minutes, please? And then I will take it back from you. 100%. So I have a couple, uh, I, I wanted to actually do a little bit of an audible. Um, so we'll definitely do the Q&A now, but I had an idea. Um, are you able to go a little past the 1.30 timeframe? I am here for you, buddy. Okay. Um, I, uh, I have slotted a little bit of time for an info session, but I wanted to actually do an audible that I think would be uh, more useful. Um, which is I'd like to kind of do a little bit of a workshop uh, kind of with BizHack uh, using that um, pyramid, uh, if you're willing, because um, I think it might be illustrative. Um, I so felt you on the uniques. Um, it is so difficult for a small business to articulate their uniques. Because the truth of the matter is very, very few small businesses really are truly unique, but they do have points of difference and points of differentiation. And I feel like you've just elucidated a, a little bit of like a cul-de-sac, like a kind of dead end that gets people stuck when they're thinking about their brand. Um, so I, I, I loved that. I actually imagine you have a blog post probably that kind of rants about the word unique in marketing. Uh, or if you don't, I would love to read it. Uh, but um, just uh, just wanted to say that as far as Q and A, um, Mark Mace Horoff asked. Oh, and by the way, guys, on the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a Q and A section. Uh, we have two questions now. Melissa just added one, and we'll go through as many as we can in the time we have. Mace Horoff said, "I have a specific business question, but don't want to bore the audience. Is Bruce available to work with private clients?" Mace, I couldn't have asked a better question myself. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. That, that's what I do when I'm not traveling around speaking at conferences. I have a number of private clients that I help with messaging strategy and brand strategy and figuring out how to move from uncertainty to clarity. I also, as Dan mentioned earlier, I put on uh, periodic strategic roundtables and masterminds 
where we get groups of people together and work on those specific issues. I have three of them. One is called Clarify for Clarity, which Dan attended. Um, one is called CE Only, C-C-E-O, N-L-Y, C-E-O, you see what I did there, uh, which is for business owners. And then the new one is called Oxygen. And the idea of oxygen is how do you put new oxygen into your business? How do you give it a real boost to get it to take off? And it's using these tools and these curriculums that I put together. So Mace, my phone number is on my website. My email address is my name, Bruce at BruceTurkel.com feel free to reach out. I would love to work with you. Love it. Um, you know, Bruce asked me beforehand, what would be like the out of the, like knock it out of the park, home run, best thing that could possibly come out of this. And I said, with total genuineness, if you could get some new clients out of this, uh, that is the best possible outcome. And the reason why is really simple. I personally have had my life and my business changed by Bruce Turkel, and I want that for you as well. I did also want to share it. You know, here's the book. Is the brand pyramid, I, I, I missed if you said if it's in this book or the next one. It is, it is. Um, what page? Uh, you know, I wrote this book a while ago. I don't remember, but I can okay. go through and find it. Well, while he's doing that, I wanted to show you something that's really important about Bruce. And now Bruce is a very skilled sketch artist and um, has beautiful handwriting. And he carries around these thick markers. And you'll notice he hand autographed this book and gave it to me. He said, it's all about Dan, Bruce Turkel. And he's, he's like the only guy of uh, nearly a thousand businesses that have gone through a program that wrote me a handwritten thank you note afterwards. And Bruce is brilliant at digital branding, you know, digital marketing, digital communications. All of you guys who I hope subscribe to his newsletter will see that. But what Bruce does better than literally anybody I know is that human to human and that kind of analog plus digital. So I did want to like kind of turn that into a question, which is you, you clearly have a kind of philosophy behind this around the power of the handwritten note. And I just wanted to ask you about that. So first to answer your first question, here it is. It's on page uh, 239. It's right Got there. it. All right, I'm bookmarking it, literally bookmarking it. So the other thing you should know is that, yes, I thank you for noticing that. I, uh, this, is, this is my new book that just came out. It's, it's titled, Is That All There Is? And I have cards and I send four handwritten notes, oh, at least four every single day. And uh, whether they're thank you notes or, hey, did you see this article? Or, hey, I'm, because my belief as I said to all of you, is that if we look at our, our RTVs, reasons to believe and our points of difference and points of distinction, we don't have that many different things to auto offer our customers or our clients. We do what others do. Dan, you put on incredible educational programs to teach people how to do business online. By the way, so does FIU, so does UM, so do lots of other organizations. Now, are yours better? Of course they are. But do I know that if I haven't attended them? I don't. And so if I just look at a list of what you offer, I go, well, yeah, I can go there, but I can also go to these other ones. So let me now conclude, because I think my, my, the conclusion I have, which will take us a few minutes over, but I'll do it quickly. And Dan, this is specifically for you, for a request you made. Um, I had asked Dan to make a point. Um, I had told him that I needed to do this presentation live and in person because I wanted to play something for you guys on the piano to make my point. Um, Dan obviously was too cheap to get me a piano. So we had to figure out some other alternative, but I want you to go back with me to Leipzig, Germany in the 1740s. Now there's a guy there, you've all heard of him, Johann Sebastian Bach. He was a very famous composer. He was a very famous um, uh, songwriter. And he has gone down in history as probably one of the most significant, if not the most significant musician and, and composer in the history of the world. Yet when he started his business, nobody knew that. Kind of like Dan with his, with his program, nobody knew how good he was. And so he still had to make a living. So he was a, well, he wasn't actually a piano teacher because pianos, believe it or not, had not yet been invented. Um, he was a harpsichord teacher and Bach taught 
the harpsichord and a lot of the different pieces of music that he wrote that later on became his great compositions were actually harpsichord lessons. One of them is Minuet in G. Any of you who have taken piano lessons or better yet, any of you who have kids who have taken piano lessons know Minuet in G. So I said to Dan that I needed a baby grand piano so I could play Minuet in G for you. But as I said, Dan was too cheap and I also don't play the piano. Um, but I was trying to think of what else I could do. And I know someone on here said, play the guitar, but I thought that, you know what? Bach didn't play the piano. He played a harpsichord, which as far as I know, was a miniature harpsichord. I mean, a miniature piano. So I brought a miniature harpsichord and I'm gonna play Minuet and G for you. And it sounds like this. I know most of you, thank you. I know most of you know that piece of music, even in my tortured rendition. So I want to jump from Johann Sebastian Bach to Sonny Boy Williamson from 1740 to 1940, from Leipzig, Germany to Vicksburg, Mississippi. Now, Sonny Boy Williamson is completely different than Johann Sebastian Bach. Johann Sebastian Bach was short, Sonny Boy was six foot six. Johann Sebastian Bach had that white wig. You've seen it. Uh, Sonny Boy wore a black bowler cap, bowler hat. Um, Sonny Boy Williamson was African-American. Johann Sebastian Bach was European, European. So they were very different, but they both were composers. And Sonny Boy wrote lots of music, you know, because it was redone by Eric Clapton and the Animals and the Yardbirds and, and Nirvana. Lots of bands, Led Zeppelin, lots of bands used his music. And one of the pieces of music he wrote was called peachy tree. And peachy tree sounds like this. Now, I know what y'all are thinking, which is, why the hell is this guy doing this? Because I can. No, because there's a deep piece of learning in there. Both of those guys are as different as different can be. Both of those pieces of music are as different as different can be. They both use exactly the same seven notes. If you remember the sound of music, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Right, it's easier this way. That's all there is. Sure, you can go up the scale or down the scale. There's octaves, there's sharps and flats, but there's only seven notes. Every piece of Western music ever written uses the same seven notes. What makes them different? The guys who wrote the songs, the guys who play the music. Your business is exactly the same as everybody else's. The only thing that makes it different that in fact is unique is you. And so when you look to figure out how do you make your business different, remember what I said when we started, don't focus on your business, focus on your consumer. Remember what I said next, a good brand makes people feel good, but a great brand makes people feel good about themselves. And remember what I told you after that, plus F minus F. Focus on your customer, make them feel good about themselves by giving them less facts, which is what we all do, and giving them instead more feelings. And you do that by giving them the best of who you are and demonstrating how doing business with you makes their lives better. If I can help you with that, I would be delighted to. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much for doing that. That was the other request I had in terms of making this just a grand slam for us. So you've, uh, as always, met and uh, exceeded our expectations. By the way, you know, 
in addition to being uh, a thought leader, an author, uh, a blog writer, Bruce is also a musician. Uh, do you have any uh, gigs coming up? As a matter of fact, uh, some of the guys in my band and I are playing tomorrow night at an open mic in South Miami. We're putting together a new band. So uh, we will very soon and I will certainly keep you posted. That's I great. also play trumpet, Wendy. That was my first instrument. <laughs> And then, uh, you know, the other thing is Bruce uh, is also a keynote speaker and um, marketing consultant. So, uh, you know, if you need a great speaker for your upcoming talk, uh, Bruce is your guy. Um, and uh, I think I put the, I'm going to put his email address. Uh, it's just Bruce at Bruce Turkel, right? Dot com. Bruce at Bruce Turkel dot com. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, um, so Bruce. Uh, if you're willing, I'd love, um, and I think this would be actually really helpful uh, for people who know BizHack's brand, but maybe would be interested in seeing a little more of the guts of it. And frankly, it'd be useful for us to kind of more sharply define our brand value uh, in, in, is if you'd be willing, maybe we could quickly just like run as an exercise through the, the brand pyramid. Um, and, and you could kind of coach me a little bit on how to um, sharpen up my articulation of it. Am I charging you my standard consulting fee? 100%. Bill me. You'll get it. Sounds Don't good. Me. We'll pay you. <laughs> well, so did you want to share? Get did you want to share? Did you want to share your screen and we could just go through it? You know, we don't need to take a lot of time, but just kind of maybe take me through it. I assume you start at the bottom. Well, let's share the screen. And actually, you do need to take a lot of time, but we won't take a lot of time now. Yeah. All right. All right. So there's your pyramid. Yeah. The first thing you're going to do is list your reasons to believe. And the reasons to believe in your case are the number of classes you put on, how long you've been doing it for, how many people have gone through your programs, the quality of the speakers you bring, the, I forget the number you use, the $14 billion that people have earned since they've uh, taken your programs and on and on and on and on. And this list should be endless. It should be really boring because mm -hmm. no one's ever going to see it but you need to go get everything on there. And I would recommend that you talk to people who have worked in your program, people who've been through your program, um, because there's gonna be things in there that you're not going to think of, that people are gonna say, oh my God, the greatest thing was the whatever. For example, when I speak at conferences, I usually open with that harmonica thing. And then at the end, we've taped harmonicas under all the chairs and I teach everybody how to play and they can play a, a very famous song that they all know. And people have told me that they go home and the first thing they do when they see their husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, spouse, whatever, they don't talk about who they met or what they learned at the conference. They say, look what I can do. And then they play that piece of music on the harmonica. But more importantly, it showed that they can open their brains, that they can try new things, that they can think out of the box. But there's always another idea. Who the heck would have thought that a little instrument like this could be used as you know that sort of teaching tool. So I didn't know that until people talking about it. Or another example, you talked about sketching. When I take notes, this is how I take the notes from my meeting. Here's the meeting we did today. There's the table, you know, um, how long have y'all been married? There's the name tag, there's the ring, there's the pyramid, there's the harmonica. So that's how I take my notes. I didn't think anything of it. One day my agent saw that and said, oh my God, what are those? And I told him, and he said, could you do them in color? I said, of course. And I drew them in color. And we now send them when I'm, when I'm pitching a gig and the meeting planners go crazy. And then we say, look, we take those and you can now reprint them and use them as the leave behinds for your session. Then we print them, we frame them and we give them to all the attendees. They hang them up in their offices. It's got my name on it and it has the meeting planner's name on it. So it becomes a promotional device, but I never thought of that. So if I was doing reasons to believe, I never would have put my ability to draw caricatures in boring meetings as a RTB. You see Love how it. it works? Yeah, when let me I throw a couple others out. So like who your partners are, like being partnered with the office of the mayor, you know, having kind of the caliber of talkers like you, uh, of speakers like you, uh, the promotional partners. Um, also, I think, you know, any testimonial or what they call social proof also feels like a reason to believe. I, and I do see how that list can and should get very long. And then I guess, depending on who the audience is, you'll pull one or another out. Yes, you're going to use that as a 
as like your, your tackle box, right? To get the right lure for the right fish, but you have to have them all laying in front of you. What's more, you're gonna look at which ones, if, if you believe my conclusion, that whatever it is that makes it you, you're gonna look at that at the end and then say, okay, what of those things make this me? So for example, the fact that you work for the mayor's office, that's a lovely testimony. I mean, the mayor's incredible. The fact that you have the credibility to do the job, but there's more to it than that because part of who you are is that you are involved in really the fundamental foundational aspects of this community, both when you were at LRN and through the work your wife did at Catalyst, and now your connection with Danilo and everybody at the mayor's office, that says a whole lot more than the mayor patting you on the head and says, Dan is really good at what he does, because that's you, that's not any vendor. And that's what makes the sales. So sure, you could go to UM and take this course or FIU. I don't wanna pick on those places, You know, pick on somewhere else. But if you go to those, you don't get Dan. What does Dan bring to the table? By the way, most people are too um, um, humble to list those things, which is why you need to go to somebody else and say, he, what else am I missing? Just like when my agent saw the notes that I just happened to show him and said, what is that? And I was kind of embarrassed, like, oh, that silly thing. Oh, that's just some dumb drawings I do. He goes, oh my God, no, that's the awesomest thing, you know? So, all right, so then if we keep going, then you jump up to PODs, which are our points of difference, points of distinction. And you start talking about what is it that makes you different? So the fact that I can draw and play music, that's not unique. My drawings might be unique because I draw like I draw, mm. but being able to draw is not unique. Being able to play music is not unique. It's different though. You don't know a lot of people who can do that. And if I add my superpowers, which are, I see things differently, I have ideas, I can communicate those ideas, meaning I can draw, I can write, I can speak, I can play music, and I can present so I can get people excited about them. You remember this from our program together, that's called skill stacking. And that combination can become unique. The individual skill sets are not unique, but the combination of them can be. Got it. So like, for instance, my journalism background, having worked at, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, NPR and PBS shows, having, you know, gotten a master's degree in storytelling makes me less unusual as a journalist, but very unusual as a marketer or a marketing uh, educator. And some, being a storyteller makes you a good marketer. I mean, that's what marketers do. However, it makes you very unusual as a IT education person, right? Because that's a soft skill and a hard skill combined. You don't see that very often. That's, you know, a, a great surgeon who has great bedside manner. You would say, I don't care about their bedside manner. I just want to make sure that the surgeon is the best at what they do. So I get a good outcome. But the truth is a good bedside manner sets up a much better outcome in many cases. And so let me give you a point of distinction that's not necessarily a unique, which is our individualized coaching right? Like there are lots of other individualized coaching programs, but what you tend to find with online educators is they tend to make it more like recorded lessons and generic. And we really believe that it's the one-on-ones and the small group coaching that really is where the transformation happens. And so it's not a unique, there are other coaching companies, but it is an area of distinction from other online educators, if you will. That's fair because remember, um, Points of distinction don't have to be points of difference. Distinction is what are you really good at? Difference is where are you different? Sometimes the, your ability, being really good at something makes you different. Like there's lots of really bad harmonica players. It's why you don't get invited up to play very often because usually someone in a bar has a harmonica, nobody wants to hear them. You become the loudest person in the room really quickly. Yeah, yeah. here's another quick point of difference which is my improv comedy background which has caused me to completely improvise this last 30 minutes and take something that would have been less effective and turn it into a wonderful teaching moment that really kind of puts uh, kind of a great, I think, capstone on these amazing lessons by giving kind of a little mini case study. So, so yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Like, it's sort of like who you are and who your company are and that skill stacking and the kind of intermeshing of your identity and your uniqueness with the ways that manifest through your business. And who is the most perfect example of that in 
a story just ripped out of the headlines is President Zelensky. What did he do before he became president? He was a comedian, actor, and producer. Absolutely. He knows, pardon me? No, absolutely. And it actually occurred to me that Zelensky was considered an ineffective president before the war. He because what do they say about the fire tempers the steel? Um, politicians look for the opportunity to step up to the plate and demonstrate leadership. Leadership is not about getting someone to run into a burning building in front of you. Leadership is about creating other leaders, which is what he's doing. He's creating leaders around his country and around the world who are fighting back and pushing back. Uh, but without being given the, the tumult to demonstrate your abilities, then you don't need to be a leader. Then you need to be an administrator. You know, and I'll, get, I'll put on another point, which is the, the pods can emerge due to circumstances. In other words, the BizHack Live series came out of my experience as a live radio producer and the need that was created by COVID. So it's like, it's like Zelensky's kind of thin resume and television background might have hurt him in the early part of his presidency, but it was like the perfect thing for the moment when he was in a televisual war. And so, you know, do, do you think sometimes pods can be um, circumstance driven? You know, for a minute, I had to figure out what a pod was because I've always called it PODs. But uh, yes, abs absolutely. And think about it. If the world hands you an opportunity for your business, what could be better than that? Your ability to respond, which once again, goes back to your improvisational comedy background or Zelensky's improvisational comedy background. Think about the videos that Zelensky has been showing where he's in a green military t-shirt with stubble he has a studio. They haven't gotten that into the inner sanctum. He could have great lighting and a steady camera. There's a reason why those cameras are shaking and the lights are bad and he looks like he hasn't slept. Clearly he hasn't slept, but he's also got makeup people. But he understands how to use the tools and he's been thrust into that position. You're absolutely right. So I just pointed that while you're going to the next level, when you're doing your points of distinction and points of difference, those are dynamic. They're not static. They change according to the circumstances. So you, this is not a, a one time and done process. This is a, 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 a psych, cyclical process where you can revisit this every six months or a year and come up with new, um, more circumstance-based points of distinction and points of difference. All right, rational benefits. So what are the rational benefits of doing business with you? That's an easy one. Make more money track to new customers, kind of achieve your, the freedom you imagined when you started your small business. Freedom is not rational. Make more money is rational. Attract new customers is rational. Freedom lives on the next level. Okay. So, right. So the rational benefits are like kind of the, the kind of benefits your CFO would really appreciate. Your, uh, you know, like financial benefits, bottom line benefits, Patting your wallet benefits, make uh, you know, supporting your family, your staff benefits, things that Generally, are generally if you can enumerate them with facts and figures, they tend to be. Now you could say freedom, how many days did you not have to go to work? But mm -hmm. that's a stretching it. But usually the ones that go in rational benefits are enumeratable on a spreadsheet. Got it. It's like the KPIs or key performance indicators, the quantifiable benefits. You know, if you work with us, you will get, you know, 3x your return on marketing spend. Three That's, times. Right. That's right. So then if we go up a step. And then emotional benefits are like freedom. Like all of us start a small business because we hate having a boss and we want to make a lot of money. Um, and most of us, you know, often, uh, you know, don't achieve that freedom that we originally imagined uh, when we started our business. And so if you have control over your growth, you have the ability to grow uh, uh, and have that freedom you imagined for yourself. So, so I think um, that kind of is more to the emotion of being a business owner or an entrepreneur. That's right. Oops. Um, and then finally, if we go one more step, the brand value. And the brand value is the accumulation of all of this and how you describe it. So for example, if we were doing Nike, you could go all the way up to rational, you know what that is, then what's emotional? 
Well, Nike talked to their customers and, and potential customers. And what did they say? I know I need to exercise, but I don't. Why? Well, I had to get up early because I had to prepare this presentation for BizHack. Well, I had two jobs. Well, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too rich. I'm too poor. I'm too skinny. I'm too fat. I'm too healthy. I'm too sick. And what did Nike say? Three words. Y'all know it. Just do it. They didn't say it. Just do it because we're better. Just do it because we're cheaper. Just do it. They said, just do it. They sounded like my grandfather. Like my Papa, hi, I would say, you know, Papa, I don't think I can ask that girl out. I'm too nervous. She's so pretty. And he would say, it's all right. Just do it. They created a emotional connection that said, we are all athletes. We can all do this. And any great company that has built a powerful brand, if you look back at what the brand is, it came out of the strivings, the aspirations, the desires, the wants of the customer. So you do an optimal outcome, which is just what I asked you when you asked me to do this presentation. In your wildest imagination, when it's over, what's happened? And you told me, and then you work backwards from that to where your customer is today. And somewhere on that path, you will find your brand value. Hmm. So let me just run through this for you, Bruce. So your reasons to believe is, you know, you come from a family of entrepreneurs and, and, and agency owners. You've run your own agency. You're a keynote speaker who makes, you know, one, two, three, you know, uh, six, five figures and speeches. You, um, your points of differentiation is not only are you an incredibly uh, dynamic verbal communicator, you also can draw, you also can play music. The rational benefits for working with you are that when we um, hear you speak, we will be given specific actionable guidance that will help us have better and more deep relationships uh, with our customers and ultimately make more money. The emotional one is you will make us feel great uh, in the process and give us something that we can tell our wife about when we go home tonight. What is the brand value? Well, back up a second. When I'm speaking, which is the specific thing you're talking about, you're not my, the audience is not my customer. People think, speakers think the audience is their customer. Oh my God, the audience loved me. That's not your job. The meeting planner is my customer. Yeah. The person who hired me is my customer. And what is their, what do they need to feel great about themselves? What they need is that the boss says to them, wow, Dan, thanks for bringing that guy in. That was awesome. Because if I suck, if I come in hungover or I forget my lines, he or she gets fired. Um, but if I come in and everyone says to the boss, oh my God, coming to the annual meeting was worth it. Oh my God. I, I had a client recently where one of their members in their organization said to the owner of the company, bringing Bruce in and listening to what he had to talk about the workshop was worth the entire value of what it cost me to be in this group this year. So that's who my customer is. My customer is not the audience. The audience is my end user. They're the ones who use my product. They're my consumer. That's a whole different conversation that we haven't even gotten to. But in this case, you and Danilo and ultimately uh, Mayor Levine Kava are my customers. Everybody who's on the right side here on the, on the, on the uh, attendees list, I love you guys and I'm thrilled you're here and I work really hard to give you something. But why? So you come back and say to Dan, wow, BizHack Live is awesome. I'm coming to the next one. That's my job. Never confuse those. Because when you do, I promise you, you will pay the wrong master. Can't hear you. You've hit your mute. What you're talking about, we sometimes describe as the buyer and the user. And the buyer is oftentimes not the same person as the user. What you're, what you're talking about is really a kind of almost like a universal quality of marketing whether it's B2B and you have the CFO is the buyer and the director of marketing is the user, or if you're running a dance studio and it's the dance mom is the buyer and the dance dancing girl, 14 year old girl is the user, um, or you run a pest control company and the, the wife is the buyer, but the barbecuing dad is the user. Like there, there's almost always a buyer and a user. And, and uh, to your point, I was confusing them. So, so my that's question- That's so funny you said that. I just spoke to the DSOA the dance studios of America. And I tried to explain to them, the little girl who's learning how to 
I, I don't know enough dances. I memorized them from my presentation, but who's learning how to dance or getting ready for the quince or the whatever is not your customer. The mother is your customer or the father is your customer or the grandmother is your customer. And it's a very, very, very important distinction. I love it. Now the user can put pressure on the buyer. Mommy, mommy, you know, I saw my friends on Instagram at the dance class. I want to be a part of it too. So they can, the user can influence the buyer, but you always have to remember who the buyer is. So then my question to you is, could you just articulate your brand value for the, for the mayor, for the buyer of the keynote speech? My brand value is simple. I lead people from uncertainty to clarity. I help my clients make their products and services more valuable. Love it. And did it take you a long time to figure that out? I only figured it out yesterday. I've been working on it my entire life. <laughs> oh, that is the perfect place to end. Thank you so much, Bruce, for taking this extra time. I hope those of you guys, epiphany, Kirk said. Uh, so I think it worked for some of us to kind of really put some flesh on the bone. I know an hour is not a lot of time for you guys. So, so thanks for sticking with us. We saw almost nobody leave, Bruce. Um, and we had more than 100 total participants today. So very appreciative of you and all that you're doing for our community uh, and for the small businesses around the world. Thank you so much. Happy to stay in touch with any of y'all who are interested. Just let me know. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye-bye.